listen to them and try to explain them, for I do not in the least agree with those who say that all pleasures... Yeah, but you have to make sure you're talking loud enough for the people in the back row. Okay. So I will turn to them and try to explain them, for I do not in the least agree with those who say that all pleasures are merely surcease from pain. But as I said, I use them as witnesses to prove that some pleasures are apparent, but not in any way real, and that there are others which appear to be both great and numerous, but are really mixed up with pains and with cessations of greatest pains and distresses of body and soul. But what pleasure, Socrates, may rightly be considered true? Those arising from what are called beautiful colors, or from forms, most that arise from odors or, and sounds. In short, all those, I'm sorry, in short, all those, the want of which is unfelt and painless, whereas the satisfaction furnished by them is felt by senses, pleasant and unmixed with pain. Once more, Socrates, what do you mean by this? My meaning is certainly not clear at this first glance, and I must try to make it so. For when I say beauty of form, I am trying to express not what most people would understand by the words, such as the beauty of animals or of paintings, but I mean, says the argument, the straight line and the circle and the plane and the solid figure formed from these by turning lathes and rulers and patterns of angles. Perhaps you understand. For I assert that beauty, that the beauty of these is not relative, like that of other things. But they are always absolutely beautiful by nature and have peculiar pleasures in no way subject to comparison with the pleasures of scratching. And there are colors which possess beauty and pleasures of this character. Do you understand? I am trying to do so, Socrates, and I hope you also will make your meaning still clearer. I mean that those sounds which are smooth and clear and send forth a single pure note are beautiful, not relatively, but absolutely, and that there are pleasures which pertain to these by nature and result from them. Yes, that also is true. The pleasures of smell are less a less divine class but they have no necessary pains mixed with them. And wherever and in whatever we find this freedom from pain, I regard it always as a mark of similarity to those other pleasures. These then are two classes of pleasures of which I am speaking. Do you understand me? I understand. And further, let us add to these the pleasures of knowledge, if they appear to us not to have hunger for knowledge or or pangs of such hunger as their source. I agree to that. Well, if men are full of knowledge and then lose it through forgetfulness, do you see any pains in the losses? Mm, not by their inherent nature, but sometimes there is pain in reflecting on the event when a man who has lost knowledge is pained by the lack of it. True, my dear fellow, but just at present we are recounting natural feelings only, not reflection. Then you are right to say, in saying that we feel no pain in the loss of knowledge. Then we may say that these pleasures of knowledge are unmixed with pain and are felt not by the many, but only by very few. Yes, certainly. And now that we have fairly well separated these, ple these pure pleasures and those which may be pretty correctly called impure, let us add the further statement that these intense pleasures are without measure and those of the opposite sort have measure. Those which admit of greatness and intensity are often or seldom great or intense. We shall assign to these the class of the infinite, which circulates more or less freely through the body and soul alike. And these others we shall assign to the class of the limited. Quite right, Socrates. There's still another question about them to be considered. Well, what is it? What kind of thing is most closely related to truth? The pure and unadulterated, or the violent, the widespread, the great, and the sufficient? What is your object, Socrates, in asking that question? 
my object, Protarchus, is to leave no gap in my test of pleasure and knowledge. If some part of each of them is pure and some part impure, in order that each of them may offer itself for judgment in a condition of purity, and thus make the judgment easier for you and me and all our audience. Quite right. Very well. Let us adopt that point of view toward all the classes which we call purer. First, let us select one of them and examine it. Uh, which shall we select? Let us first, if agreeable to you, consider whiteness. Mm, by all means. How can we have purity and whiteness? And what purity? Is it the greatest and most widespread, or the most unmixed, that in that in which there is no trace of any other color? Clearly, it is the most unadulterated. Right. Shall we not then, Protarchus, declare that this, and not the most numerous of the greatest, is both the truest and the most beautiful of all whiteness? Quite right. Then we shall be perfectly right in saying that the little pure white is whiter and more beautiful and truer than a great deal of mixed white. Perfectly right. Well then, we shall have no need of many such examples in our discussion of pleasure. We see well enough from this one that any pleasure, however small or infrequent, if uncontaminated with pain, is pleasanter and more beautiful than a great or often repeated pleasure without purity. Most certainly. And the example is sufficient. Here's another point. Have we not often heard it said of pleasure that it is always a process or generation and that there is no state or existence of pleasure? There are some clever people who try to prove this theory to us, and we ought to be grateful to them. Well, what then? I will explain this whole matter, Protarchus, by asking questions. Go on, ask your questions. There are two parts of existence, the one self-existent, the other always desiring something else. What do you mean? What are these two? The one is by nature more imposing, the other inferior. Uh, still speak more plainly. We have seen beloved boys who are fair and good and brave lovers of them. Yes, no doubt of it. Try to find another pair like these in all the relations we are speaking of. Must I say it a third time? Please tell your meaning more plainly, Socrates. It's no riddle, Protarchus. The talk is merely jesting with us, and means that one part of existences always exists for the sake of something, and the other part is that for the sake of which the former is always coming into being. I can hardly understand after all your repetition. <laughs> Perhaps, my boy, you will understand better as the discussion proceeds. I hope so. Let us take another pair. What are they? One is the generation of all things, the process of coming into being. The other is existence or being. I accept your two, generation and being. Quite right. Now, which of these shall we say is for the sake of the other? Generation for a sake of being, or being for the sake of generation? You are now asking whether that which is called being is what it is for the sake of generation? Yes, plainly. For heaven's sakes. Is this the kind of question you keep asking me? Tell me, Protarchus, whether you think shipbuilding is for the sake of ships, or ships for the sake of shipbuilding, and all that sort of thing? That's just what I mean, Protarchus. Then why did you not answer it yourself, Socrates? There's no reason why I should not. But I want you to take part in the discussion. Certainly. I see that drugs and all sorts of instrumental and materials are always employed for the sake of production or generation, but that, in, but that every instant of generation is for the sake of some being or other. And generation in general is for the sake of being in general. That is very clear. Then pleasure, if it is a form of generation, would be generated for the sake of some form of being. Of course. Now surely for the sake of which anything is generated is in the class of the good. And that which is generated for the sake of something else, my friend, must be placed in another class. Most undeniably. 
then if pleasure is a form of generation, we shall be right in placing it in a class other than the, that of the good, shall we not? Quite right. Then as I said when we began to discuss this point, we ought to be grateful to him who pointed out that there is only a generation, but no existence of pleasure. For he's clearly making a laughing stock of those who assert that pleasure is a good. Ah, uh, yes, most emphatically. And he will also surely make a laughing stock of all those who find their highest end in forms of generation. How is that? And to whom do you refer? To those who, when cured of hunger or thirst, or any of the troubles which are cured by generation, are pleased because of the generation as if it were pleasure, and say that they would not wish to live without thirst and hunger and the like if they could not experience the feelings which follow after them. Um, that seems to be their view. We should all agree that the opposite of generation is destruction, should we not? Inevitably. And he who chooses as they do would be choosing destruction and generation, not that third life. In which, we, in which there was neither pleasure nor pain, but only the purest possible thought. It is, great, it is a great absurdity, as it appears, Socrates, to tell us that pleasure is a good. Yes, a great absurdity. And let us go still further. How? Is it not absurd to say that there is nothing good in the body, or many other things, but only in the soul, and that in the soul the only good is pleasure, and that courage and self-restraint and understanding and all that the other good things of the soul are nothing of that sort, and beyond all this to be obliged to say that he who is not feeling pleasure and is feeling pain is bad when he feels pain, though he be the best of men, and that he who feels pleasure is, when he feels pleasure, the more excellent in virtue, the greater the pleasure he feels? All that, Socrates, is the height of absurdity. Now let us not undertake to subject pleasure to every possible test and then be found to give mind and knowledge very gentle treatment. Let us rather strike them boldly everywhere to see if their, mental, their metal rings unsound at any point. So we shall find out what is by nature purest in them and then we can make use of the truest elements of these and pleasure to form our judgment of both. Right. Well then, one part of knowledge is productive. The other has to do with education and support. Is that true? Mm, it is. Let us first consider whether in the, manual, in the manual arts one part is more allied to knowledge and the other less. And the one should be regarded as purest the other is less pure. Yes, we ought to consider that. And should the ruling elements of each of them be separated and distinguished from the rest? And what are they, and how can they be separated? For example, if arithmetic and the sciences of measurement and weighing were taken from all arts, what was left of any of them would be, so to speak, pretty worthless. Yes, pretty worthless. All that would be left for us would be to conjecture and to drill the perceptions by practice and experience with the additional use of the powers of guessing, which are commonly called arts, and acquire their efficacy by practice and toil. That is undeniable. Take music first. It's full of this. It attains harmony by guesswork based on practice, not by measurement. And flute music throughout tries to find a pitch of each note as it is produced by guess, so that the amount of uncertainty mixed up in it is great, and the amount of certainty small. Mm, very true. And we shall find that medicine and agriculture and piloting and <coughs> generalship are all in the same case. Certainly. But the art of building, I believe, employs the greatest number of measures and instruments which give it great accuracy and make it more scientific than most arts. In what way? In shipbuilding and house building and many other branches of woodworking. For the artisan uses a rule, I imagine, a lathe, com compasses, and chalk line, 
and an ingenious instrument called a vice. Ah, certainly, Socrates, you are right. Let us then divide the arts, as they are called, into two kinds, those which resemble music and have less accuracy in their works, and those which, like building, are more exact. Agreed. And of these, the most exact are the arts which I just now mentioned first. I think you mean arithmetic, and the other arts you mentioned with it just now. Certainly, but Protarchus, ought not those to be divided into two kinds? What do you say? Uh, what kinds? Are there not two kinds of arithmetic? That of the people, and that of philosophers? Uh, how can hmm. one kind of arithmetic be distinguished from the other? The distinction is no small one, Protarchus. For some arithmeticians reckon unequal units. For instance, two armies and two oxen and two very small or incompar incomparably large units, whereas others refuse to agree with them unless each of countless units is declared to differ not at all from each and every other unit. You are certainly quite right in saying that there is a great difference between the devotees of arithmetic, so it is reasonable to assume that it is of two kinds. And how about the arts of reckoning and measuring as they are used in building and in trade when compared with philosophical geometry and elaborate computations? Shall we speak of each of these as one or as two? On the analogy of the previous example, I should say that each of them was two. Right. But do you understand why I introduced this subject? Perhaps. But I wish you would give the answer to your question. This discussion of ours is now, I think, no less than when we began it, seeking a counterpart of pleasure, and therefore it has introduced the present subject and is considering whether there is one kind of knowledge purer than another, and one pleasure is purer than another. That is very clear. It was, in, is, it was evidently introduced with that object. Well, had not the discussion already found in what preceded that the various arts had various purposes and various degrees of exactness? Certainly. And after having given an art a single name in what has preceded, thereby making us think that it was a single art, does not the discussion now assume that the same art is two and ask whether the art of philosophers or that of the non-philosophers possess the higher degree of clearness and purity? Yes, I think that is just the question it asks. Then what shall we make, Protarchus? Socrates, we have found a marvelously great difference in the clearness of different kinds of knowledge. That will make the reply easier, will it not? Yes, to be sure. And let our reply be this that the arithmetical and metrical arts far surpass the others, and that of these, the arts which are stirred by the impulse of the true philosophers are immeasurably superior in accuracy and truth about measures and numbers. We accept that our judgment, and relying upon you, we make this confident reply to those who are clever in straining arguments. What reply? That there are two arts of arithmetic and two of measuring, and many other arts which, like these, are twofold in this way, but possess a single name in common. Let us give this answer, Socrates, to those who you say are clever, and I hope we shall have luck with it. These, then, we say, are the most exact arts or sciences? Certainly. But the art of dialectic would spurn us, Protarchus, if we should judge that any other art is preferable to her. But what is the art to which the name belongs? Clearly, anybody can recognize the art I mean, for I am confident that all men who have any intellect whatsoever believe that the knowledge which has to do with being, reality, and external immu immutability... Eternal. Oh, excuse me. And eternal immutability is the truest kind of knowledge. What do you think, Protarchus? I have often heard Gorgias constantly maintain that the art of persuasion surpasses all others. For this, he said, makes all things subject to itself, not by force, but by their free will, and is by 
far the best of all arts. So now I hardly like to oppose either him or you. Nice. It seems to me that you wanted to speak and threw down your arms out of modesty. Very well. Have it as you like. Is it my fault that you have misunderstood? Misunderstood what? My question, dear Protarchus, was not as yet what art and si or science surpasses all others by being the greatest and best of and most useful to us. What I'm trying to find out at present is which art, however little, and of little use, has the greatest regard for clearness, exactness, and truth. See, you will not make Gorgias angry if you grant that his art is superior for the practical need of men, but say the study of which I spoke is superior in the matter of the most perfect truth, just as I said in speaking about the white, that if it was small and pure, it was superior to that which was great but impure, now, therefore, with careful thought and due consideration, paying attention neither to the usefulness nor to the reputation of any arts or sciences, but to that faculty of our souls, if such there be, which by its nature loves the truth and does all things for the sake of the truth, let us examine this faculty and say whether it is most likely to possess mind and intelligence in the greatest purity or we must look for some other faculty which has more valid claims. I'm considering, and I think it is difficult to concede that any other science or art cleaves more closely to truth than this. In saying that, did you bear in mind that the arts in general and the men who devote themselves to them make use of opinion and persistently investigate things which have to do with opinion? And even if they think they are studying nature, they're spending their lives in the study of the things of this world, the manner of their production, their action, and the forces to which they are subjected. Is that not true? Yes, it is. Such thinkers then toil to discover not eternal uh, verities, but transient productions of the present, the future, or the past? Perfectly true. And can we say that any of these things become certain? if tested by the touchstone of strict, strictest truth, since none of them ever was, will be, or is in the same state? Of course not. How can we gain anything fixed whatsoever about things which have no fixedness whatsoever? In no, no way, uh, as it seems to me. Then no mind or science which is occupied with them possesses the most perfect truth? No, it naturally does not. Then we must dismiss the thought of you and me and Gorgias and Philebus and make this solemn declaration on the part of our argument. Uh, what is this solemn declaration? That fixed and pure, that fixed and pure and true and what we call unalloyed knowledge, unalloyed knowledge, has to do with the things which are eternally the same without change or mixture or with that which is most akin to them, and all other things are to be regarded as secondary and inferior. Very true. And of the names applied to such matters, it would be fairest to give the finest names to the finest things, would it not? That is reasonable. Are not mind, then, and wisdom the names which we should honor most? <coughs> yes. Then these names are applied most accurately and correctly to cases of contemplation of true being. Certainly. And these are precisely the names which I brought forward in the first place as parties to our suit. Yes, of course, they are, Socrates. Very well. As to the mixture of wisdom and pleasure, if anyone were to say that we are like artisans with the materials before us from which to create our work, the simile would be a good one. Certainly. And is it? And is it then our task to try to make the mixture? Surely. Would it not be better first to repeat certain things and recall them to our minds? What things? Those which we mentioned before. I think the proverb, we ought to repeat twice and even three times that which is good, is an excellent one. <laughs> Surely. Well then, in God's name, I think this is the gist of our discussion. What is it? Philebus says that pleasure is the true goal of every living being and that all ought to aim at it. 
and that therefore this is also good, the good for all. And the two designations, good and pleasant, are properly and essentially one. Socrates, however, says that they are not one, but two, in fact, as in name, that the good and the pleasant differ, differ from one another in nature, and that wisdom's share in the good is greater than pleasures. Is not, and was not that what was said, Protarchus? Yes, certainly. And furthermore, is not, and was not, this a point of agreement among us? What? That the nature of the good differs from all else in this respect? In what respect? That whatever living being possesses the good always, altogether, and in all ways, has no further need of anything, but is perfectly sufficient. We did. I guess we're repeating. Three and four times. <laughs> and then we tried and thought to separate each other, each from each other, and apply them to individual lives, pleasure unmixed with wisdom, and likewise wisdom which had not the slightest alloy of pleasure. Yes. And did we think then that either of them would be sufficient for anyone? By no means. And if we made any mistake at that time, let anyone now take up the question again, assuming that memory, wisdom, knowledge, and true opinion belong to the same class, let him ask whether anyone would wish to have or acquire anything whatsoever without these, not to speak of pleasure, be it never so abundant or intense, if he could have no true opinion that he is pleased, no knowledge whatsoever of what he has felt, and not even the slightest memory of the feeling. And let him ask in the same way about wisdom, whether anyone would wish to have wisdom without any, even the slightest pleasure rather than with some pleasures, and all pleasures without wisdom rather than the, with some wisdom. That is impossible, Socrates. It is useless to ask the same question over and over again. Then the perfect, that which is to be desired by all and is to, and it is altogether good, is neither of these? Certainly not. We must then gain a clear conception of the good, or at least an outline of it, that we may, as we said, know to what the second place is to be assigned. Quite right. And have we not found a road which leads to the good? What road? If you were looking for a particular man and first found out correctly where he lived, you would have made great progress toward finding him, who you sought. Yes, certainly. And just now we received an indication, as we did in the beginning, that we must seek the good, not in the unmixed, but in the mixed life. Ah, uh, certainly. Surely there's a greater hope that the object of our search will be clearly present in the well-mixed life than in the life which is not well-mixed. Far greater. Let us make the mixture, Protarchus, with a prayer to the gods, to Dionysius or Hephaestus, or whoever he be who presides over the mixing. By all means. We are like wine pourers, and besides us, our or, and beside us are fountains. That of pleasure may be linked to a fountain. Likened. That of pleasure may be likened to a fount of honey, and the sober, wineless fount of wisdom to one of pure, health-giving water, and of which we must do our best <coughs> to mix as well as possible. Certainly we must. Before we make the mixture, tell me, should we be most likely to succeed by mixing all pleasure with all wisdom? Mm, perhaps. But that is not safe, and I think I can offer a plan by which we can make our mixture with less risk. What's that? We found, I believe, that one pleasure was greater than another, and one art more exact than another. Certainly. And knowledge was of two kinds, one turning its eyes toward transitory things, the other toward things which neither come into being nor pass away, but are the same and immutable forever. Considering them with the view of truth, we judged that the latter was truer than the former. That is quite right. Then what if we first mix the truest sections of each and see whether, when mixed together, they are capable of giving us the most adorable life, or whether we still need something more and different? I think that is what we should do. 
Let us assume then a man who possesses wisdom about the nature of justice itself and reason in accordance with his wisdom and has the same kind of knowledge of all other things. Agreed. Now will this man have sufficient knowledge if he is a master of the theory of the divine circle and sphere but is ignorant of our human sphere and human circles? even when he uses these and other kinds of rulers or patterns in building houses? We call that a ridiculous state of intellect in a man, Socrates, which is concerned only with divine knowledge. What? Do you mean to say that the uncertain and impure arts of the false rule and circle is to be put into our mixture? Yes, that is inevitable, if any man is ever to find his own way home. And must we add music? which we said a little while ago was full of guesswork and imitations and lacked purity? Yes, I think we must, if, we, if our life is to be a life at all. Shall I then, like a doorkeeper who is pushed and hustled by a mob, give up, open the door, and let all the kinds of knowledge stream in, the impure mingling with the pure? I do not know, Socrates, what harm it can do a man to take in all the other kinds of knowledge if he has the first. Shall I then let them all flow into what Homer very poetically calls the mingling of the veils? Certainly. They are let in. And now we must turn again to the spring of pleasure. For our original plan for making the mixture, by taking first the true parts, did not succeed. Because of our love of knowledge, we let all kinds of knowledge in together before pleasure. Very true. So now it is time for us to consider about pleasure also, whether these two shall be let loose together, or we shall let only the true ones loose at first. God is much safer to let loose the true first. We will let them loose then. But what next? If there are any necessary pleasures, as there were kinds of knowledge, must we not mix them with the true? Of course, the necessary pleasures must certainly be added. And as we said, it was harmless and useful to know all the arts throughout our life. If we know, if we now say the same of pleasures, that is, if it is advantageous and harmless for us to enjoy all pleasures throughout life, they must all form part of the mixture. What shall we say about these pleasures and what shall we do? There's no use in asking, Protarchus. We must ask the pleasures and the arts and sciences, sciences themselves about one another. Well, what shall we ask them? Dear ones, whether you should be called pleasures or by any other name, would you choose to dwell with all wisdom or with none at all? I think only one reply is possible. And what is that? What we said before. For any class to be alone, solitary, and, and unalloyed, is neither altogether possible, nor is it profitable. But of all classes, comparing them one with another, we think the best to live with, the best to live with is the knowledge of all other things, and as far as is possible, the perfect knowledge of our individual selves. Your reply is excellent. We shall tell them. Right. And next we must turn to wisdom and mind and question them. We shall ask them, do you want any further pleasure in this mixture? And they might reply, what pleasures? Quite likely. Then we should go on to say, in addition to those true pleasures, do you want the greatest and most intense pleasures also to dwell with you? How can we want them, Socrates, they might say, since they contain countless hindrances for us, inasmuch as they disturb with maddening pleasures the souls of men in which we dwell thereby preventing us from being born at all, and utterly destroying, for the most part, through the carelessness and forgetfulness which they engender, those of our children which are born. But the true and pure pleasures of which we spoke, you must consider almost our own by nature, and also those which are united in health and self-restraint, and furthermore, all those which are handmaidens, handmaids of virtue in general, and follow everywhere in its train as if it were a god. Add these to the mixture. But as for the pleasures which follow after folly and all baseness, 
It'd be very senseless for anyone who desires to discover the most beautiful and most restful mixture or compound and try to learn which of them, which of its elements is good in a man and in the universe and what we should divine its nature to be to mix these with mind. Shall we not say that this reply which mind has now made for itself and memory and right opinion is wise and reasonable? Certainly. But another addition is surely necessary, without which nothing whatsoever can ever come into being. And what is it? That in which there is no admixture of truth can never truly come into being or exist. No, of course not. No, but if anything is still wanting in our mixture, you and Philebus must speak of it. For to me it seems that our argument is now completed, as it were an incorporeal order which shall rule nobly a living body. And you may, Socrates, say that I am of the same opinion. And if we were to say that we are now in the vestibule of the good and of the dwelling of the good, should we not be speaking the truth after a fashion? I certainly think so. What element, then, of the mixture would appear to us to be the most pre oh, precious and also the chief cause why such a state is beloved by all. When we have discussed this, we will, we will then consider whether it is more closely attached and more akin to pleasure or to mind in the universe. Right. For that is most serviceable to us in forming our judgment. And it's quite easy to see the cause which makes any mixture whatsoever either of the highest value or of none at all. What do you mean? Why, everybody knows that. Knows what? That any compound, however made, which lacks measure and proportion, must necessarily destroy its components, and first of all itself. For it is in truth no compound, but an uncompounded jumble, and is always a misfortune to those who possess it. Ah, perfectly true. So now the power of the good has taken refuge in the nature of the beautiful, for measure and proportion are everywhere identified with beauty and virtue. Certainly. We said that truth also was mingled with them in the compound. Certainly. Then if we cannot catch the good with the aid of one idea, let us run it down with three. Beauty, proportion, and truth. And let us say that these considered as one may more properly than all other components of the mixture be regarded as the cause, and that through the goodness of these, the mixture itself has been made good. Quite right. So now, Protarchus, anyone would be able to judge about pleasure and wisdom, and to decide which of them is more akin to the highest good and of greater value among men and gods. That is clear. But still, it is better to carry on the discussion to the end. Let us then judge each of the three separately in its relation to pleasure and mind. For it is our duty to see to which of the two we shall assign each of them as a more akin. You refer to beauty, truth, and measure? Yes. Take truth first, Protarchus. Take it and look at the three. Mind, truth, and pleasure. Take plenty of time and answer to yourself whether pleasure or mind is more akin to truth. Why take time? For the difference to my mind is great. For pleasure is the greatest of impostors. And the story goes that in the pleasures of love, which are said to be the greatest, perjury is ev even pardoned by the gods, as if the pleasures were like children, utterly devoid of all sense. But mind is either akin with truth or of all things most like it, and truest. Next then, consider measure in the same way, and see whether pleasure possesses more of it than wisdom, or wisdom than pleasure. That is also easy to thing to consider, for I think nothing in the world could be found more Im immoderate than pleasure and its transports, and nothing more in harmony with measure than mind and knowledge. You are right. However, go on and tell about the third. Has mind or pleasure the greater share in beauty? So that mind is fairer than pleasure, or the other way around? 
But Socrates, no one, either asleep or awake, ever saw or knew wisdom or mind to be or become unseemly at any time or in any way whatsoever, now or in the future. Right. But pleasures, and the greatest pleasures, at that when we see anyone enjoying them and observe the ridiculous or utterly disgraceful element which accompanies them, fill us with a sense of shame. We put them out of sight and hide them so far as possible. We confine everything of that sort to the right to the night time as unfit for the sight of day. Then you will proclaim everywhere, Protarchus, by messengers to the absent and by speech to those present, that pleasure is not the first of possessions, not even the second, but first. The eternal nature has chosen measure, moderation, fitness, and all which is to be considered similar to these. That appears to result from what has now been said. Second, then, comes proportion, beauty, perfection, sufficiency, and all that belongs to that class. Mm, yes, so it appears. And if you count mind and wisdom as the third, you will, I prophesy, not wonder far from the truth. That may be. And will you not put those properties forth which we said belong especially to the soul? Sciences, arts, and true opinions, they are called. And say that these come after the first three, and are fourth, since they are more akin than pleasure to the good? Perhaps. And fifth, those pleasures which we separated and classed as painless, which we call pure pleasures of the soul itself, those which accompany knowledge and sometimes perceptions? Maybe. But with the sixth generation, says Orpheus, cease the rhythmic song. It seems that our discussion, too, is likely to cease with the sixth decision. So after this, nothing remains for us but to give our discussion a sort of head. Yes, that should be done. Come, then. Let us for the third time call the same argument to witness before Zeus the Savior and proceed. Hmm. Uh, what argument? Philebus declared that pleasure was entirely and in all respects the good. Apparently, Socrates, when you said the third time just now, you meant that we must take up our argument again from the beginning. Yes, but let us hear what follows. For I, perceiving the truths which I have now been detailing, and annoyed by the theory held not only by Philebus, but by many thousands of others, said that mind was far a far better and more excellent thing for human life than pleasure. True. But suspecting that there were many other things to be considered, I said that if anything should be found better than these two, I should support mind against pleasure in the struggle for the second place. And even the second place would be lost by pleasure. Yes, that is what you said. And next, it was most sufficiently proved that each of these two was insufficient. Very true. In this argument, then, both mind and pleasure were set aside. Neither of them is the absolute good, since they are devoid of self-sufficiency, adequacy, and perfection. Quite right. And on the appearance of a third competitor, better than either of these, mind is now found to be 10,000 times more akin than pleasure to the victor. Certainly. Then according to the judgment which has now, then according to the judgment which has now been given by our discussion, the power of pleasure would be fifth. So it seems. But not first. Even if all the cattle and horses and other beasts in the world, in their pursuit of enjoyment, so assert. Trusting in them as augurs, 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 as augurs trust in birds, the many judge that pleasures are the greatest blessings in life. And they imagine that the lust of beasts are better, are better witnesses than are those aspirations and thoughts inspired by the philosophic muse. Socrates. We all now declare that what you have said is perfectly true. Then you will let me go? Mm. 
There is still a little left, Socrates. I am sure you will not give up before we do, and I will remind you of what remains. Perhaps, maybe. So it seems. We read through it. <laughs> Let me ask you one question, all right, just to have a little fun. I'm not sure about this word. Um, how is it being used in the dialogue? Anyone have a couple True. of quotes? Oh, I think there were several. True. True. True or true. Got a couple? There were several. I need a couple of good quotes. B, please. Hold it. Everybody there. Hold it. Hold it. Okay. Give it a shot, please. That in which there is no admixture of truth can never truly come into being or exist. You know, there, I have one quote that I'll offer. Uh, please. I have a quote on 379. Two. 379. 379. Which says at <coughs> E, and knowledge was of two kinds, one turning its eye towards transitory, transitory things, other towards things which neither come into being nor pass away, but are the same and immutable forever. Considering them with a view to truth, we judge the latter was truer than the former. Which may not be exactly what you're looking for either, but does give us what falls into the category of truth, or true or <coughs> See if we can find yet a third. If you went to the next, uh, 65C. So which one? 65C. 65C, another connection. 65C, 391. Hold it, everybody. Mm -hmm. Tarkas says, you refer to beauty, truth, and measure. And Socrates says, yes, take truth first, Tarkas. Take it and look at these, take it and look at the three, mind, truth, and pleasure. Plenty of time and answer to yourself whether pleasure or mind is more akin to truth. I thought that was describing the, the mixture of the good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look, I have all the good one. Yeah. Oh. Well, this one's kind of obvious. Uh, 349. Uh, 349. That's a good number. <laughs> but, uh, hold it, hold it just for a moment. He asks what kind of thing is most closely related to truth. That mm. gives us at least a little bit of insight into how he's using it. Uh, the two options are the pure and unadulterated, or the violent, the widespread, the great, and the sufficient. Later, it's, later it's, it's pure. Well, look her. Well, how about accuracy? Well, 
Yes, go ahead, Barbara. Oh, yeah. Well, there's another standard, too, that he said, he says, oh, this is on 365, and he says... Hold it, 365. Yeah, Hold so it. it's at... Um, Just a second. 57... That happens to be one of my favorite pages. <laughs> Please. Well, uh, I, I, uh, it says that the, at the C it's saying, um, after giving, well, okay, I'll jump to the quote that I have. Yes, to be sure, and let our reply be this, that the arithmetical and metrical arts far surpass the others, and that of these, the arts which are stirred by the impulse of true philosophers, are immeasurably superior in accuracy and truth about measures and numbers. So it seems like he bonds it to. Well, then he also says that um, I'm confident that all men who have any intellect whatsoever believe that the knowledge which has to do to do with well being reality and eternal immutability is the truest kind of knowledge. Where's that? Yeah. That's at 58a. But I think that's still not quite saying what truth is. Well, i tell you why I have this curious question, because... Uh, we hope you have a curious quote as well. So, <laughs> go ahead, sir. <laughs> if we took the conclusion to this work, I want to ask a couple of questions, all right? See, we want to know, did we not from the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, this problem of ignorance, There are three people in the dialogue. Each one of them, each one of them admits to a degree of ignorance. So look here. Ignorance. Sock. Milibus. Protar. Is there? Any growth? Do they, as it were, get smarter or wiser? No. It, try something. Is it possible that we can find where Protarchus sees what formerly he didn't see? I think we go further and say, not only does he see what he formerly did not see, but what he sees is a good point. In other words, is there signs of growth development? Yes. If there is signs of growth and development, then would you agree he's gaining an insight? Into a whole bunch of words. <laughs> and among them, do you think you can put this one? Pleasure, truth, knowledge. Is it possible that he is gaining a better understanding of this word. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Truth? Oh, I would say at that part on page 393 where he says... Pardon me, what page? 393. Um, hold yeah. it. 100%. Okay, everyone got that one? Let's use that for the moment, all right? In that same quote, he says that pleasure okay. is... This is why. Option. Okay, this is why, okay? Pick any quote you want that defines what you think might be... 
shows this understanding about truth. Would you agree at the conclusion of the five levis on the last page, Pratarka says, Socrates, we all now declare that what you have said is perfectly true, right? highest level of truth. If, therefore, he is right, and we understand the marks of truth, what it constitutes, then when you go back, we can now look at the dialogue of Socrates agrees with him or doesn't object, then we should find everything that is being said about truth in the book, in the dialogue. Right? We're turning it on itself, aren't we? And if so then, right, then you could confirm, could you not, whether or not his understanding is quite appropriate at the end, and that shows a development and a certain level of growth. Would you agree? We can get all of these words, and we can then define them in terms of the text, and see whether or not each of these people understand how they're being used, or the degree to which they understand them, and we can give them a grade in the beginning and in the end, through the dialogue. Uh, what would you be showing you can do, if that's true, by the way? Yeah. Oh, I'd like to offer a... What? I was going to offer a quote. Okay, then this would be an answer to the question. Uh, yeah. Um, on page 349, at the top of the page, um, Sock says, what kind of thing is most... Can I read what kind of thing is most closely related to truth? The pure and unadulterated, or the violent, the widespread, the great, and the sufficient. How could we use that now? Come on. That's the task. Yeah. Look Those at, are descriptions of... What are the ideas that are included in the idea of truth? Those listed? Hmm? Those listed. Pure Existence. Pure. Those listed. Those the, the listed on that, that page? Uh -huh. Come on, more. Come on. Come on. Well, that Sock describes tr those things related to truth would be the pure and unadulterated, or the violent, uh -uh. right, what, what is, okay, no, I lost the beat, no, does anybody else want to read it? No I'm waiting a while before you change, okay, okay, you're trying to help us understand this word and you're focusing on page 349 as a way of helping, right? Mm -hmm. and helping on the word truth. And looking for yeah. places in the book. That Therefore, the word truth should be on page 349, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Right? And could you focus on it and read the sentence? Start from the beginning. What kind of thing is most closely related to truth? The Come on. The, the pure. pure and, and unadulterated. Uh, we've got two marks, right? Mm -hmm. We need more. Mm. Then we need to know what are the classes that are in the pure and what kind of things are in the class of the unadulterated. Mm -hmm. um, so, see, look, let me go back. Okay. Um, We're doing a lot of defining, aren't we, in this work? And seeing how certain things relate, or is that what we're doing? Looking for accuracy. And we're trying to see whether there's some growth, is that what we're trying to do in this chart? Uh, what would you say we're doing? 
what words would describe what we're trying to do? Education. Well, we're trying to see those things for ourselves, aren't we? Aren't we trying to see those things for ourselves? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I just wondered whether that might be uh, the idea of measure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking. Oh, does measure play a role? <clears throat> oh, and if you can see changes. Uh, by the way, would this end up being, if we do this table, a analogical table? Hmm. Proportion. Oh, would it also therefore include measure, analogy, division? What? Come on, come on, come on. True. Mm -hmm. If we did this table right, and apply it to the whole work, then our next task, what we're doing here, see, is that we're trying to see uh, levels of insight from the beginning to the end, right? And we're focusing on the key words, and the one we're using right now is truth, aren't we? Because he says, not only is it what you're doing, Socrates, is true, but it's perfectly true. Mm -hmm. What if all of the terms he uses to describe these things, we can now apply to the text and see whether it's in the text? What would you be doing if you were doing that? Measuring. Training. You'd be exercising the mind in a certain kind of thing. What would that be? Dialectic. What? I said training the understanding. Uh, under, under what? Understanding. Yeah. Standing under what? Mm -hmm. Under the truth. <laughs> Is this the dialectic? It's a yeah. dialectic. Yeah. Is this the dialectic? Yes, sir. Oh. So this is the use of the dialectic to look to see where we can find growth and development in a class of beings that are willing to admit they're ignorant. Here's the harder part for the whole dialogue, okay? Now, <clears throat> I'm going to, do, you know, I always like to volunteer for the more difficult part if you guys take the rest. <laughs> I mean, it's fair as fair, isn't it? True. Okay. I'll show the lines of development of Philebus. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> you guys take Socrates. Not true. Remember, he admits to ignorance. Mm -hmm. Can you go to that section? But see, you have to practice on Philebus. Mm -hmm. By the way, are these extremes? Mm -hmm. Oh, he wouldn't be in the middle, would he? Mm -hmm. Oh. Let me do that one again. Oh. <laughs> So let's talk about it once more in general the next time we come back. Okay. All right, now, Barbara, with her excellence, by the way, was able to get two books, which are quite remarkable, one on allegories. This is uh, Suwardi, and he's a major player in the whole Islamic philosophy game, whole book on theory of illumination. Interesting theory. He's going to show you through a series of examples that the light of lights gives birth to <clears throat> what he calls proximate light or brilliance, and through a step, series of steps, as it diminishes, he gets to which for him <clears throat> is congealed light. Yeah. Sure. I mean, he's got a cosmology and a philosophy where he's going to show the different levels of reality or different levels of light. Mm -hmm. So I thought I could come up with maybe uh, 10 pages or so where he explores that. And if you're into that, uh, we'll get him Xerox and get, pa you know, pass around stacks of tens. Mm -hmm. Now, the other work he has, which is on allegories and mystical tradition, Barbara was able to get, and she's got a good story to share you with the difficulty she had getting it and the cost. Mm 
That's equally interesting. And uh, the difficulty is that they aren't principles. They're no principles. There is his, his allegories. So it's not the principles of allegories like we might get in Plato or other thinkers. It's the use of them to explain this. That may be easier to deal with, but let me make that judgment the next time I see it. What's the name of the other book? Okay. Pardon me? It was in the email. It was what? What's the name of the book? What's the name of the book? The this one? The, the other book. book. The the riddles of the riddles and mystical tradition of Suwardi. Good shot. I'm not yeah. sure, but it is in the email. It's very it's difficult to get. The correct email. email. It's in the. It it's cheap, though, the isn't it, Barbara? Bibliography there. No, it wasn't cheap. It was actually that was if you want to hear the short form of yeah. the story, which is I bought one on on Amazon. They had one for eighty dollars, and then oh. like twelve for a hundred and fifty dollars. And so I bought the one for eighty dollars, being no fool. And uh, and I get a I get a message that it's coming my way, and then suddenly I get a message saying the money's going back into my account because they what, the phrase was something like the last one they had at that price had had been sold. So I thought, yeah, it looks to me like you pulled it from the market and sold for one hundred and fifty. But another one popped into the up on Amazon for eighty five dollars. From another book sales people, so I I got that one, and I passed that to Pierre since he had an interest in it. And, uh, so rather than tell you guys, let's go out and get a book for either eighty-five or a hundred and half. Uh, I'll take a little more time to get it to see whether we might be able to Xerox a bunch of pages. So it's interesting though; it has Arabic. It's like Arabic and English. Um, yeah. Pages, <coughs> Arabic, he started a whole movement in the Islamic tradition. And uh, later they had a lot of fun running, hunting them down and killing them. But, uh, Tried to develop a philosopher king. Yeah, he, he was put to death. Yeah, he was put to death. Okay. Uh, those of you who are thinking of and have decided to do the uh, Esalen trip, uh, bring a copy that includes the allegory, the um, myth of Ur, please. Myth of Ur.